King Abdullah II of Jordan is urging the United Nations to continue humanitarian funding for Palestinians and is asking for help for Jordan with refugees. The king making his appeal at the U.N. General Assembly Tuesday. It comes after President Trump cut off $350 million in aid for the U.N. agency that distributes the funding. I talked with King Abdullah about his relationship with President Trump and the continued unrest in the Middle East. King Abdullah of Jordan delivers an address to the U.N. General Assembly on a host of pressing issues. We have a long way to go to deliver global opportunity and hope. But we cannot simply give up because the task is hard. He sat down with me to give us an assessment of his region. Well, where do you want to begin? I yeah. mean, I think that that's the problem is um, at all points of the compass, we still have challenges. Um, Syria, to an extent, uh, ISIS um, is, is defeated, not destroyed. And you can apply that to, um, to Iraq also. Um, but how do we move the political process in Syria? How do we stabilize? This is something that we can get into um, relatively um, calm in the south. Uh, because there's a crisis management center that is operated by the Russians and Americans in Jordan, hosted by us for deconfliction. Uh, we're looking to, to make uh, um, the, the South better. Iraq is still going through uh, some of its turmoils. Uh, obviously, as the government settles down, uh, we want to make sure that um, you know the national um, military uh, is all-encompassing and a building block uh, to move uh, to the future. We have the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue um, to, to our west. Um, Yemen uh, to our south. So, you know, we have to be light on our feet, and uh, there's a lot of balls being juggled in the air. Yeah, it's a busy neighborhood. On the ISIS front, um, the large perception was that they've been destroyed largely, but there seems to be a, either a comeback or an ideological kind of upbringing for well, young people. I mean, let, let, let's <clears throat> keep in mind, we're calling these people ISIS or Daesh. Right. They're no different than Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, or any other uh, group out there. So this is a global problem. Um, they are the most used names because they're the most vicious and most violent. But that doesn't mean that all those groups are any different from each other. So today we're talking about ISIS. Um, you know, four or five years from now, maybe there's another name that's developed and they become even worse. There's two stories in Syria and to an extent two stories in Iraq. One is the countries moving forward and redeveloping themselves and coming down. But there's still a fight against insurgents. You have concerns about about the peace process uh, and recent moves. Well, look, you know, the president from from day one was committed to a a fair and balanced deal for the Israelis and Palestinians to move the process forward. We're not too sure what the plan is. That's part of the problem. Um, so it's more difficult for us to be able to step in and, 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 and help. What I'm worried about is we're going to go to, from the two-state solution to a one-state solution, which is a disaster for all of us in the region, including Israel. If most of the status uh, final status issues are being taken off the table, then you can understand Palestinian frustration. So how do we build the bridges of confidence between the Palestinians and the United States? Because it, whatever people say, you cannot achieve a two-state solution or, or a peace deal without the role of the Americans. So at the moment, the Americans are speaking to one side, not speaking to the others. And so that's the impasse that we're at. President Trump, is, if he's anything, is, is pretty blunt. Uh, so, so exactly, and I think that's, that's the breath of fresh air. The president sort of, as I said, look, if we go to this, the one-state solution, here are the problems that we're all going to face. And he was like, wait a second. And he went from A to Z like that. I was like, okay, fantastic. He, he went straight through the problem, came to the solution, and we looked at each other and said, okay, <laughs> you know, we need to work on the two-state solution. Um, the one-state solution, I think, is a major problem for um, how Israel presents itself and internally how it presents itself, because the reality is that we're talking about apartheid, and, 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 and that, I think, there's a lot of uh, supporters of Israel outside of Israel that are really concerned, are they heading in the right direction? Now, can we get the two-state solution on, on track? Can we find an amiable and fair solution between the two others? Because the one-state solution frightens the heck out of all of us. Last time we talked, uh, the region was in turmoil. Uh, ISIS was on the rise in 2015. The other thing we talked about back then was Yemen. I would humbly suggest that uh, the quicker we find a political situation to that, that issue, um, the, the, the better. I still believe that's the case. We're three uh, years later. Three, three years later, um, um, uh, it is a, a very difficult um, um, uh, campaign. Uh, and the quicker that uh, all of us get to a political solution, I know that the, the, the Saudis and the UAE are working very hard. We have to keep in mind that there is concern of the humanitarian crisis, which I 
I think is is still unfolding. Um, the UAE have been uh, really leaning forward and being trying to bring as much relief supplies as possible uh, to, to, to the Yemenis. But unless we can get the parties together and find a political solution, this is going to continue to be a black hole for all of us, I think. Iran is obviously active in Yemen. They're funneling money and weapons. Ma and many other places in the region. Through your eyes, how does Iran look? You can see an um, Iranian signature, what I see the Iranian crescent, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Lebanon. Um, you mentioned the Yemen, we're seeing them in the Horn of Africa. Is there a way to get Syria to a political solution? So we're working on things. I mean, um, um, sometimes the policy changes uh, by certain people in American institutions that sort of throw us off a bit. Um, having said that, uh, we, the, the, the Americans and the Russians, as I said, we have the Joint uh, Command Center in, in Jordan that helps in deconfliction. Uh, we do have a strategy. Um, you know, uh, we had uh, agreements with the Russians and the regime on, uh, on dealing with the Iranians. Uh, that's had a slight hiccup in the past couple of weeks, but I'm expecting hopefully that to come back into the right fold. Um, and as I said, uh, we are all working and understanding that the Iranians are not helping anybody. But again, from the Iranian point of view, they want to be as close to the Mediterranean as possible. So they're going to do all efforts to continue to be in those areas and to be a mischief uh, maker. In your country, 20% of the population now Refugees? 21 percent only Syrian refugees. Um, that's not to count almost illegal, uh, a million illegal Egyptian workers that are in our country that we took a decision many years ago not to send back to Egypt because it would destabilize their economy. So that's the right thing, although the difficult thing. A uh, couple of hundred uh, thousand uh, Iraqi refugees th that are in our country uh, and a total of about um, 50 to 60,000 Yemenis and uh, Libyan refugees. So what kind of pressure does that put on? Tremendous. 21 percent of a population uh, increase in a couple of years. That's like 60 million Can Canadians just appearing on your border um, in a period of two or three years. And then you've got to take, uh, when you first started, at least a quarter of your budget for a couple of years just to look after your guests. Say that again, 60 million if you look at the U.S. Uh, 60 million Canadians coming over in, in two you've got to deal with them. And you've got to deal with them. And the international community is helping and the biggest supporters are the United States and Europe. But when it, when it, as of this year, 2018, we're only getting 16% of the support from the international community. That means that we have to borrow the rest from the international community just to fund the Syrian refugees. Now, we do have to reform, we do have to become self-sufficient, but donor fatigue is a major problem. And it's an international responsibility. I mean, uh, if, if you look at, uh, at, at how many refugees Europe has taken um, and, and see the role that Jordan has done, uh, we're actually taking the load off a lot of other countries, but help us because we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So some people in the U.S. would say, you know, you got a, a bunch of rich countries there, Saudi Arabia, UAE, a lot of oil-rich countries. Are they chipping in? We hope that they can do more. Um, uh, uh, the UAE has uh, built uh, refugee camps in, 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 uh, in Jordan and supported the refugees. Um, uh, but we're, we are in discussion with them to see whether they can help us a bit more because of these challenges. What do you tell your kids about the future? We're in a, in a very chaotic world today where there are enemies of us all, um, and, and specifically these uh, extremist groups we call the Khawarij, the outlaws of Islam. Uh, this is an issue that's going to be with us for the next 10, 15 years. So whether we like it or not, this is an international fight. I've called it a third world war by other means, um, which is going to be with us for, unfortunately, another decade or two. I hope the military aspect is going to be short, but then it's the ideological aspect that we're going to have to fight over the next 10, 15 years. Your Majesty, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.